Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, this is Dustin from MADPOW. Um, I head the Behavior Change Design Department here, and um, we've got, uh, I think, a, a great event for folks today. Um, thinking about uh, how we're living our lives at home and we're, we're at home uh, here today and um, talking about social distancing and um, what might work and what kinds of interventions uh, we might try with our populations um, to make it more likely that, that people stay, stay home. And we're going to talk a bit about uh, some research uh, that was done with a, a nice team of 45 researchers and the Italian government. And I've got Jan here, um, who is part of that um, research, who's going to lead us through uh, this webinar today. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Jan to introduce himself. And uh, we'll take some questions and discussion at the end. So welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining. I'm an assistant professor at Harvard Business School, and a lot of my research actually focuses on how we can motivate people uh, in, in terms of their behavior. And what I find really uh, important to, to point out at the start of this is that when we're thinking about the crisis that we're facing right now in terms of the coronavirus, is that it's a unique crisis in that it's not just a public health emergency. It's not just about making sure uh, that we are um, that we have the right amount of hospital beds. It's not just about making sure that we're pushing through in a vaccine, but also really approximately in the next few hours, days, weeks, and months ahead, it's a huge behavioral problem. And the biggest behavioral problem is how we can minimize the spread by encouraging social distancing, which means encouraging people to engage in behaviors, behaviors like washing their hands, behaviors like minimizing the amount of time that they spend outside, making sure that they keep their distance from others. And what this means is that we need to understand how we can get people to do these behaviors in order to make sure that we collectively as societies are actually able to do this. So I'm hoping that today is really a launching pad for further conversations and thinking within all of your organizations to highlight how exactly we can roll this out toward the people that we're in touch with, the populations that we care about, and that we're actually able to influence. And so I will show you some initial data that we did together with the Italian government and a bunch of researchers around the globe. Um, but I really hope that it's more of a launching pad for further discussion on what we can do approximately in our own backyards with our own populations uh, and make sure that we leave more than enough time for questions and answers there. So without further ado, uh, I would like to just highlight, I think, why we're all here. And that's that this is a global pandemic uh, that has really just taken on a really, really uh, high amount of caseload, and it's only going to explode uh, for the next few weeks and months. So we're, we're really far away from the peak, actually, in most of the world. And that really the most effective thing to do uh, in the next coming weeks and months is to really encourage social distancing. So uh, what we wanted to do uh, is work with the Italian government um, and and as you all know, Italy is really hardest hit from everything that is that is happening with the coronavirus right now. And so we try to understand how we can encourage people to engage in social distancing and here particularly to stay at home. Uh, as you know, most of Italy is under quarantine and particularly in the north of Italy, really any leaving their apartments or homes is, is strongly discouraged and only allowed um, if, if people have an absolutely necessary reason to leave their homes. And it's absolutely important that really everybody sticks with it. It's not just enough if 90% of the population does this or 80% of the population does this. You really need to make sure that everybody in the population does this to make sure that you're effectively able to minimize this spread. And the reason why we tried out uh, different kind of treatments with only 160 characters is that what we're aiming to do is to do an SMS campaign, so actually sending text messages to people across Italy. And so we wanted to explore what kind of different treatments would actually be most effective. And the control condition here is just a minimal information message that reminded people to stay at home. In terms of the different treatments that we tried, we tried to draw from the behavioral scientists toolbox in terms of a number of different things that might be effective here. Uh, the first two treatments that you see here are really focusing on the externalities. 
So a lot of the times when we're thinking about why people might not actually adhere to social distancing, it has a lot to do with the fact that people are thinking about themselves and particularly if that person is younger, they might not realize that there's a risk to themselves or they might think that you know if they do get infected, it's not gonna be all that bad for them. Whereas in reality, it's not really so much about them themselves, but about who they can infect unknowingly otherwise. And in fact, recent research shows that over 80% of all infections are carried out by people who are asymptomatic. So people who probably don't even know uh, that they are sick and they are just interacting uh, with other people and getting them sick. So those are the first two treatments really highlighting how important it is to stay home because of everybody else that they might infect. The third treatment really focuses on the pro-sociality aspect, so highlighting that it's not about you, but it is about those that you love, those that are close to you. The first is uh, the fourth is from a social norms perspective, so really highlighting that this is something that is widely shared. Everybody is doing this. It's really important that you do it as well. And we know from social science that one of the things that motivates people is to stick with a social norm to do what the majority of people do. The fifth treatment was highlighting the expert source. So we know that we respect experts more than lay people, highlighting that the Italian Medical Association uh, made the same recommendation, as well as with doctors in treatment six. And then finally, in treatment seven, there's a variation of the graph that I'm sure many of you have seen right now, which is about this flattening the curve idea that what we need to actually do is to minimize the spread such that the healthcare systems are able to have capacity for everybody that is sick. And so we tried out all these different treatments with 2,500 people that we recruited through online panels. And what is actually interesting is that on the whole, we did not find that our treatments actually had any kind of effect on a number of different outcomes that we thought were important. Things like staying at home or disclosing an infection if people have symptoms or sharing the message with others that they know uh, or attending social events. So it's not really the case that these messages on the whole seem to have an effect. I do want to highlight that for most of these outcomes in Italy at the time that we ran the survey last week, we are at ceiling. What that means is that the vast majority of people already strongly endorse these items. And we know from research in other countries that this is not the case in other countries. That a lot of other countries, actually the population does not strongly believe that these are important things to do right now, especially when it comes to endorsing things like shutting down stores or actually uh, quarantining at home. I mentioned that on the whole, we don't find differences, but we do find really interesting subgroup differences. And this is first of all, across all treatments that as one would expect that young people are less likely to stay at home until others if they are infected. And this is probably because of this idea that exists in a lot of young people's minds that if they do get sick, it's probably not all gonna be that bad for them. Really highlighting that it might be something about the externalities that they're not fully uh, understanding and that might be worthwhile highlighting. We also see that men are less likely to share the message, and there's some research in social science highlighting that men are more risk-taking, such that men might actually be just less likely to be swayed by messages that really highlight the risk, and, and that's what coronavirus is in many people's minds. Um, and uh, we also just find that on the whole, it's not that any demographics significantly predict intentions to participate in the social events. So it's not really the case that there are some demographic groups that are more or less likely to engage in social events. When we then break down the treatment by these different demographic groups, we find that there's uh, three treatments for which we see some variation by the different treatment groups, though I wanna draw caution that for a lot of these the treatment effects are not particularly large. So when we're highlighting externalities, we see that young people are then more likely to disclose that they might be infected if they have symptoms. And we see that men are, um, are more likely to share the message. Likewise, with the social norms, we see that young people are more likely to disclose their infection, that young people are more likely to indicate staying at home, and that men are more likely to share the message. And finally, when we focus on the healthcare system, this idea of flattening the curve, we again see that young people are more likely to want to disclose their infection and men are more likely to share the message. So I, I want to, again, like zoom out uh, and, and highlight that really, it's not so much about this particular study, uh, but it's really more about understanding what we can do with this information and what we can do in our own backyard. So how can we really communicate externalities of infection? How can we help people understand what the social norms are, the vast majority of people, what they believe, and really get people to understand what the healthcare system costs are? And trying to understand that for a lot of us, we might even have the ability to do targeted messaging. And where we have the ability to do targeted messaging, it's really important to highlight those that are already least likely to endorse these things, like young people uh, and, and men. 
And so I just want to highlight what's next on the table uh, for us right now. Uh, we're launching another study today in Italy with a new set of treatments that we're trying to update uh, from the last set of treatments to really try to highlight the things that have worked out in the past um, and, and see whether we can make them a little bit more powerful. Uh, we also launched the study today with Germany Biggest Newspaper, uh, as well as trying to roll this out across countries around the world to try to understand what might be effective, what people's perceptions are of their own behavior, the behavior of others, and how people to shift in terms of their social distancing. But really what I wanted to spend the most time on today and what I've been hoping to engage with the conversation of you all is to uh, on focusing on how you can help here. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this is really a behavioral problem. Thinking about the coronavirus and thinking about what we can do right now in the next days, weeks, and months is we need to get those people that we know, those people that we have under our purview to change their behavior. And the things that we can do, I think as a starting point, for example, is thinking about text messaging campaigns. Can we reach out to the people that we have contact information for with a message asking them to respond with a pledge to engage in social, social distancing measures? Is it possible that we can email the people that we have in our purview to call on them to talk to five of their friends They may not necessarily be as bought into social distancing, to try to get them on board? Is it possible for us to run social media campaigns or competitions that exemplify good normative behavior? to really highlight that this is what important people, important organizations are doing right now. And I wanna highlight that in Rome, we're doing this right now with a TikTok campaign that highlights all the different ways that people are innovating, staying at home. And finally, I think it's by leading by example. It's by making sure that we're doing the right thing, showing and, for, and, and showcasing to others, for example, that we are staying at home, that we are washing our hands, that we are maintaining social distancing measures that we know are effective. And those are just some examples. I think there's many more things that we can do, but it's a really unique time to be in this position, to have the ability to influence the people that we have in our purview and make sure that we're able to minimize the spread and address this crisis head on. So I hope this was fast, <laughs> but, but, but we can get now to, to some of your questions and then Dustin and I can have a conversation to try to understand what we can actually do with all of this. Great, thank you all. My name is Catherine Houghton and I'll be fielding the question portion. So if you look over on the right hand side on the go to webinar control panel, you should have a box that allows you to submit questions. Um, and before you ask, yes, we are recording and we will be sending out the recording afterwards for your sharing and we'll also send out the slide deck. Um, but if you have any questions, now would be a great time to put them. And here is one from somebody named Julie. Um, and she asked, do you have any information about the issue of disinformation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really challenging perspective right now because there's just so many things that are happening, so many people that are trying to share information. Um, and it's, it's challenging. What is a trusted source of news right now? Um, and so we need to be very mindful that uh, we're operating in a time where people receive information from a lot of different sources. Um, one thing that we know from some research that uh, Dave Rand and his colleagues have done is that when we're sending messages, one of the things that we can do uh, is that we can simply ask people to check the veracity and the accuracy of the information that they're, that they're trying to consume. And just by um, shifting people's attention toward the accuracy and veracity of information, they're more likely to engage in a type of fact checking that might actually be beneficial uh, to really help understand the, the misinformation. But uh, I think uh, to Julie's question, it's a really important point right now. There is so much misinformation and we need to be very mindful of the fact um, that a lot of what we have to do is, is to address that head on. Next question, and when they're flooding in now. So, um, so Faye asks, what online resources and updates do you recommend? Um, online resources and updates that we send out to other people or online resources and updates in order to stay abreast of how to communicate to uh, to people right now? Um, I don't know, Faye, if you could clarify, I will get, stay abreast. To stay abreast. Um, I would honestly follow the, the CDC guidelines. I think that they are, uh, are really good guidelines. Also your local officials. Uh, just making sure that uh, they they have the best possible information, I would just follow those recommendations. Okay, 
Um, Lauren asks if there's a place showing the TikTok Rome campaign you mentioned. Yes, if you go on the Rome Capital Twitter page, and I can also share the link, uh, perhaps we can share that together later with um, mm -hmm. everything uh, the slide deck here, and we can make sure. But if you go on the Rome uh, Roma Capitale Twitter page right now, uh, they are advertising that heavily. Okay, great. And um, yeah, if you send me the link, I will send it out in the thank you email. Okay, and Colin asks, I am confused, are younger people and men less or more likely to share? It seems to me you stated both. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Uh, they are, on the, on the whole, they are less likely to share. In response to the treatment, we're able to shift that somewhat, that they are uh, slightly more likely to share uh, the information. But overall, when we look at across all treatments in the control condition, we see that they are less likely to share any type of messages. Great. Um, Andrea asks if we can share the slide deck freely. Yeah. Okay. Um, David asks, I didn't see the word we in any of the messages. Proud Italians, yes, but not the W word. Like, we can do this. Any reason why or why not Did you do you want to try that? Yeah, so one of the challenges operating in a, in a country there is that nationalism doesn't have the most positive connotation. And even we're, we're still uh, uh, a little unsure even about the wording of, of the word proud. Uh, and I think we're using an Italian word um, that is slightly less powerful. Nationalism doesn't have the best connotations in Italy. Um, doesn't mean that an appeal to national identity might not necessarily work elsewhere. I think we just need to be mindful of the local context that we're operating in. Hmm, interesting. Um, let's see. Kathleen asks, I have heard that there will be a public service campaign via TV commercials. Do you know if this will be part of the focus? Uh, this is not something that I have heard of or I'm involved in. Okay. Agnes asks, I recognize the research is still ongoing, but are there any articles or resources I can pass on to others? Um, there's a slide deck here. Um, and, I, and we can also share the uh, more details in a separate link. And Catherine, I can send it over to you as well Perfect. to share with us. Okay, and I'll send that in the thank you email to everybody later today. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, uh, Jonathan asks, thanks so much. With some of the social treatments, how do we know that they are the they are true quote vast majority of proud Italians? e.g. especially when talking about fact-checking and veracity from others? Absolutely. So uh, right now, one of the things that we're doing is we're fielding surveys in many countries around the world uh, to try to get an understanding of what people themselves believe. And we ask questions in two different ways. We ask what we call first-order beliefs. So what is it that people themselves believe? And we ask what we call second-order beliefs. What do people think others in their community, others in their country believe? Uh, this is all still very preliminary because we're still ongoing data collection. Um, but what we find in this data in, in all countries around the world, as well as what a lot of prior research has found, is in, those, in these type of situations, people tend to underestimate the exact extent to which other people actually endorse it. So what I mean by that is that people themselves are a lot more willing to engage in social distancing measures, are a lot more willing to endorse more, dr uh, more drastic measures, it seems but they are less likely to think that others endorse them as strongly. So there seems to be a mismatch here between how strongly people themselves believe that social distancing measures, especially drastic ones, are important and the extent to, to which they believe others in their community think it's important. And we know that uh, what's, what, what drives a lot of behavior is not just what people themselves think, but what people think others in their community and in their country think. And so there seems to be a mismatch here, but but to your point, Jonathan, I think it's it's really important that we are accurate here. Uh, and so to to share this only or to have this message only in countries where we actually have accurate information, and which is something that we're working on right now. Okay, great. Um, now Fred asks, I've heard some people suggest that we say physically distancing, sorry, physically distancing rather than social distancing, because we still want people to stay connected but just virtually, not in person. Thoughts on that? I think that's actually totally uh, a, a totally valid point. Um, Jamil Zaki had this um, op-ed in the Washington Post, Catherine, that, that we can also share with the links, mm -hmm. that made a similar case and also just highlighted the importance of social connections in a time of distancing. And so if there is a way to re 
rebrand social distancing to physical distancing, I'd be all for it. The challenge is that that's the term that's currently out there. <laughs> and so it is, it is always a trade-off between using the terminology that already exists and actually amending it to something that, that seems to be more useful here. But you're absolutely right. We need to do distancing in a time of social connection. Great. We have a question here from the NHS and Wells. Uh, from Lori, what were your population segments? I understand that you have men and younger people, but what are the others? Also, how did you determine the treatment conditions? Yeah, so uh, I think to the to the first one in terms of the segments, we looked at uh, different age groups. We looked at uh, gender. We looked at employment status. Um, and those were the three main groups. And we also looked at uh, where people lived, so the, uh, the, the community area where they lived. Um, we didn't show you results for employment because I think one of the challenges here is that we weren't adequately able to disentangle whether people had to leave their home in order to maintain their jobs and what kind of jobs they were, which is something that we're remedying in a future study. Uh, but those were the main um, segments that we were looking at. And in terms of how we came up with the treatment, I really just want to give another shout out uh, to the team of uh, 45 researchers in the Italian government. Uh, and was, it was an ongoing conversation between all of us to make sure that we land on a set of interventions that we thought would be most useful and most beneficial. And we are continuing to iterate on them to make sure that we're, we're able to present something in the future that, that is more powerful. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, from Leslie, we've got do you know of any research which has looked at what influences the behaviors of social distancing or self-isolation with the which then could be used to inform interventions yeah so i think what's interesting is that uh, there is not a lot of research on that particular behavior there's not a lot of research that has looked at what we can do to get people to stay at home if you think about it what we've tried to do in the past is we've tried to get people to leave their homes we've tried to get people to engage in like physical activity. <laughs> so that was our that was our um, aim and, uh, and the aim of a lot of behavioral change campaigns and, and interventions in the past. Um, and so while on the one hand, I think there are some things that we can learn from the from the toolbox that we've accumulated in the behavioral sciences, at the same time, we also need to understand that staying at home is a novel behavior and all interventions are, are different for different kinds of behavior. And in addition to that, this is a very novel context. So a lot of the prior research that's been done has not been done in the context of a time where people experience a great amount of anxiety. And so really the best that I can recommend that we do is to do a lot of iterative testing. So what that means is that we try out a lot of things. We try to make sure that we have a good behavioral measure or some kind of outcome that we can then dynamically adapt on and make sure that we continue to adapt, continue to iterate on what can be a more powerful option in the future. But at the moment, there just isn't a huge amount of literature, a huge amount of studies that allow us to say what will and will not be powerful, which is why it's so important to right now do a lot of exploratory work and try to actually understand what we can do. Great. Jim asked that if you could put back up the screen with the seven treatments. Absolutely. Here you go. Thank you. Um, Pedro asked, does any agency or government applied, oh, so has any agency or government applied any of these approaches? Uh, we are currently working with the Italian government to understand whether we can do this. The TikTok campaign I mentioned is in collaboration with the Italian government that they have launched. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping this call does is to call the attention that we have not received a lot of messaging from our governments. Uh, so I live in, in, in Boston here in, in Massachusetts. Um, I have not received any messaging from any of my local officials, any of my state officials. And it's the case for, for most of my colleagues and friends around the US, the UK, and really around the world, uh, that most of us haven't received any messaging from our governments. Um, isn't that interesting? Isn't that strange? Shouldn't we have? Why did I have to learn, for example, about the fact that all restaurants and bars are closing from the Boston Globe that I don't read necessarily every single day on Sunday night? Shouldn't I have received a text message or some kind of notification from my local or state government Shouldn't that be the prerogative? Isn't that something that we can advocate for, something that we should try to do? I think that's such an important thing right now to understand how we can communicate better, how we can communicate more effectively to make sure that we are able to do that. Yeah, I know in the US we have the Amber Alert system and I haven't seen anything come across that. 
Um, here is a question from Priyama. Trying to think about how this study can help other countries' messaging. Any thoughts on how cultural nuances can be considered? Yeah, I think one of the things that that um, is really interesting that I mentioned earlier is that we're trying to launch this right now uh, across many different countries around the world to try to understand some of the nuances. And the nuances here really are manifold. One of the nuances is to what extent uh, has, has the coronavirus spread in the country? How serious does the government and the population take the coronavirus? And what measures and steps has the local government actually taken? And that's a one huge source of cultural variation. And the challenge there is that this is changing on a daily basis. So it's not like I can make recommendations today for what is going to work in the future, because it's just an ongoing situation. If we think it, for example, where the US was even just a week ago, we are a far cry from a week from where we are today. And I think where we will be in a week from now. The other thing is that we know that there are cultural differences between countries that affect message effectiveness. Things like the extent to which the country has a collectivistic attitude, so the extent to which they emphasize a community or an individualistic attitude, the extent to which they emphasize the, the individual. Um, I think right now, because this is such an unprecedented situation, I wouldn't put too much money on how big these cultural differences are going to drive differences and the extent to which other differences like the spread of coronavirus and the government response has an effect. And so really the best thing, uh, in my opinion, is to do some exploratory data collection, which is what we're trying to do right now, to do a lot of testing and adaptive iterations, which is what I'm recommending that we do in order to really get a sense of what might work in different contexts with the understanding that things might also change over time. So if we find that something works today, in the United States, it might not necessarily work tomorrow because the situation has changed so dramatically. Mm -hmm. I have a question from Katrina. Do you have any thoughts on sharing messages related to other parts of this pandemic? For instance, we work in child injury prevention and we know that more time in the home means a higher chance of injury. So we're working on messages related to reducing the burden on the health system by staying safe but we don't want to appear irrelevant or insensitive. That's it. Jan, can you hear me? Hello? Sorry, I think I lost you for a second. Can you repeat that question, please? Yeah, you're pixelating a little, so. Um, yeah, be leading yeah. bandwidth. Okay, I'm looking at Katrina in the question box. Um, so do you have any thoughts on sharing messages relating to other parts of the pandemic? For instance, we work in child injury prevention and we know that more time in the home means a higher chance of injury. So we're working on messages related to reducing the burden on the health system by staying safe, but we don't want to appear irrelevant or insensitive. Yeah, I actually think that this is so, so important, right? We need to tell people to stay at home, obviously, but we also need to understand what the consequences are of telling people to stay at home. I think that's a super interesting consequence, one that I haven't thought about before, is that obviously things like child injuries are going to increase, and it takes on particular importance knowing that hospitals are going to be more and more at capacity and less able to deal with injuries. And so I think this is a really important message. We also need to understand a lot of the other things that are going to have to change with more and more people staying at home. Things like child caring duties, things like staying enrolled in education, things like uh, how, to, how to work productively from home, particularly in the times of great anxiety that we live in right now, and so on and so on. So I think there are so many second order consequences of telling people to stay home, so many second order consequences of socially or physically distancing that are just as important as telling people to stay at home because what we're facing right now is a trade-off, and it's a trade-off between the community well-being, the community physical health that we can promote by telling people to stay at home, for example, and by engaging in social distancing, but we're training that off with the community mental health and other things that are happening, and, and, and I really like this point on, on even just the physical health of our children. And so we need to trade these off very carefully and make sure that whatever interventions we're doing, whatever messaging we're doing, we're adequately addressing both. Great. 
Um, and just so I want to let people know, this was originally billed as a 30-minute webinar, but we're going to stay here until the questions are answered. Well, I'm not promising we'll be here all day, okay. but we're not going to finish in the next minute. Okay, Brady has a question. What kind of engagements do you suggest for incorporating those who cannot stay home, for example, healthcare workers? Yeah, I think those are those are just really tough questions. And I think one of the things that we can do is that we can help healthcare workers and other people who cannot uh, stay at home and ha who have to go work. The best way we can help them is to make sure that we don't leave. Um, because if we leave, then we make it more dangerous for everybody who has to leave. So I think that's one of the things that we can do. And it's one part of messaging that I think is important. The other thing is just precautions for, uh, for people who do have to leave. So I've seen a lot of um, healthcare workers, some of which are my colleagues, actually quarantine themselves from the rest of their family uh, to make sure that they minimize the spread that way, that if they do get exposed, they at least do not infect their family. But those are really just a whole different set of questions. And I have to highlight that I'm not an epidemiologist and that I think this is probably the end of my expertise and where, <laughs> uh, where, where I think the expertise of others is much more necessary. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a question for you then um, from Angela. Thank you. As a customer experience researcher, your methodology is excellent. Excellent. Ideas for how we can help how ideas for how we can help to circumvent the perceived politicizing of this issue. Yeah, I, this is a huge problem right now, especially in the United States. Um, that I, this issue has been politicized and it has been politicized from the very beginning. Um, I hope that we can set politics aside soon. Uh, my understanding is that more and more so um, politics are moving to the background when it comes to the coronavirus, but it's unclear. And so I think the, the most important thing that we can try to do is to try to set politics aside when we can, um, while obviously understanding that our messages might have a different effectiveness for, for different political ideologies. Um, and again, something that we, as of now, have very little understanding of, of how our messages might differ by political ideology, something that is going to change very quickly, day by day, really, and something that is very important to do testing on. Thank you. Um, so I got a question here from Barbara, and I've got multiple other ones in here, and I realize Priyama asked a similar one, but it's the same theme. Is your hypothesis that the same messages will work across countries or that different messages will work best in different countries? I, my hypothesis is that different messages are going to work for different countries at different points in their uh, trajectory. And by trajectory, I just mean as the coronavirus continues to spread. So that's why I think adaptive messaging is so important. I really can't go out there and say this thing is going to work all of the time for sure. Uh, the more important thing is that we do a lot of A-B testing, that we try out different messages, that we try to understand what might work by assessing the situation well, which is data that we're currently trying to collect and trying to provide. Um, but one of the things that we just want to think about is when we do collecting data, at least descriptively, on who is more and less likely to stay at home, for example, and who is more or less likely to believe that others are staying at home, um, is we do need to understand that probably just by the way that this epidemic is, is unrolling, that uh, younger people, for example, who themselves perceive to be at lower risk um, because they don't think that they necessarily are going to suffer as much, uh, that for them it might be more effective to think about externalities, to might be more effective to think about how they might infect their grandparents, for example, and there's been some very tragic cases coming out of Italy uh, mm -hmm. where that actually did happen, uh, where, where a, a grandson did infect his grandfather who then passed away. And so really highlighting some of these externalities, particularly to the younger generation, seems to be one thing that might work in some contexts for some countries at some of the time, but I do really want to highlight how important it is to test because it's a situation that is unfolding. Mm -hmm. Got a question here from Jonathan. Have you any evidence on how we message to mitigate the negative effects of the wider determinant of health and social isolation? In particular, I am interested in protecting mental well-being. Yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned before, mental well-being is something that uh, I think right now is not the focus of a lot of messaging campaigns and most messaging campaigns, or a lot of our attention right now is on minimizing the spread. But I think it's it's equally important to understand the trade-off that we're engaging in here by telling people to stay at home and, and to socially distance themselves. 
So I, I like the idea of, of rebranding here. I also like the idea of innovating around the different ways in which one might actually engage, uh, have really good social connections virtually, which isn't something that necessarily we've been doing all that much, all that well. Um, so uh, I think it would be interesting to have uh, some ideas around how people might do that and popularize them. So something uh, that I started doing is Zoom happy hours where some of my friends just get on Zoom and have a drink, pretend like we're in a bar. Uh, but it, I think it's it's important to just think about all the different ways in which we might actually maintain social connections in the time of physical distancing. Um, great, so Diane asked again, can you show the slide highlighting differences for subpopulations again? Here you go. <laughs> Uh, and somebody asked again, yes, we will be supplying the decks um, after the fact, so don't worry about it, and the um, links to the research report, so that'll all come after the fact. Um, let's see, Deirdre says, it seems that many people are out buying guns. <laughs> Yay, US. How do we keep people from panicking slash build confidence in this time of mis misinformation? Yeah, uh, honestly, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I also saw those reports, um, and it's such a delicate balance because on at so, on some level, on some level, we want people to take this extremely seriously. Um, on another level, we want to make sure that people don't panic, um, and it's just such a fine line. And again, we this is such an unprecedented situation. It's it's it hasn't happened in many 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 decades that we have been in a situation where, where really we, we, we don't really know where this, where this journey is gonna go. Uh, where the one thing that we do know is that many, many people will, will die. Um, and we just don't know how many. And um, it's something that we need to be attentive to. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have answers. The only thing mm -hmm. that I can offer is questions. And the questions are, how do we, uh, how do we motivate people to take this seriously without motivating some people to panic? Um, how do we make sure that people have somebody to talk to when they do panic, when they are anxious? And many, many people are anxious right now. And so I think those are really interesting questions that I think we need to ask ourselves, that we need to discuss, but nothing that I have an answer for today. Okay. Um, Dustin, this might be one that you can take. Um, it's from Neil. How linked in are you with research on the effects of social distance on individuals? For example, their fears, worries, will I go mad looking at my own walls for weeks, etc.? cetera? Um, well, actually, uh, not, not very. I think, um, as, <laughs> as, Jan, as Jan said, that um, you know, often in the first uh, phase of, of looking at these kinds of, uh, of problems, um, we want to look at what works and, and build off of evidence and build off of behavioral insights that exist um, so that we know where to look for what kinds of treatments um, that we might want to test. Um, there's not a lot of direct um, evidence that uh, I've come across uh, in terms of um, context, populations, behavior uh, that, is, that is similar. So, I've not got a lot um, in, in, in my investigations. I don't know, Jan, if you've come up with more, but in these kinds of contexts, we look at things that are maybe analogous or similar mm -hmm. to, but there's not a lot of one-to-one -one or, or any uh, that, that I've really found um, where we can say, for sure, for this kind of behavior, for this kind of population, here are some things that work or don't work. Um, this is why the, the experimentation um, and, and coming up with your best judgment of what kinds of uh, interventions to run and then test and refine and test and refine is the best, is a process that may get us where we want to be. All right, Dustin, yeah, here's and, another one. Sorry, go ahead, Guy. Sorry. Yeah, and I just want to highlight that there's a number of different outcomes that we can optimize for. Uh, and, and the question is just what our priority is. So some of uh, my colleagues in Italy are, for example, looking at GPS data of people's phones and try to understand whether the measures that are currently being taken in Italy are effective in terms of reducing the amount of movement that they can detect through the GPS signals on people's phones. And then try to see whether the reduction in movement as tracked by the GPS signal then predicts infection rates five to six days later because we know that that's more or less uh, the median incubation time before patients start showing symptoms. 
And those again, if if that is our if that is the outcome that we're optimizing for, uh, then you will have a very different kind of understanding of what you should do than if you're trying to optimize other things, right? If you're trying to optimize, for example, making sure that people wash their hands, um, you're just going to have a very different kind of understanding of what to do. Which is why I think one of the things we need to understand is what is the priority right now. What is it that we're trying to understand? What is it we're trying to change? But then as a second consequence of that, I think it is equally important to think of the second order outcomes of this. So if we're telling everybody to stay at home and self-quarantine, what effects is that going to have on their mental health? What effect is that going to have on their children? And how can we make sure that we also then reduce any negative effects that are likely to occur as a result of telling people to stay at home? Um, here's one for you, Dustin. It involves human-centered design from David. It sounds like you're moving fast and trying all sorts of good ideas, but I'm not seeing this as a human-centered design approach. What are the early options? Why are the early options not working? What are people's mental models? What is failing? You won't learn this from the data. You need to talk to people and find out how they are forming their views, what they believe, and how they are feeling. Please look at HFES, medication adherence, many conditions, a common problem. Um, I believe that people are not believing that this is a problem that comes from the stories and leadership, not facts. Yep. So um, I'm, I'm, Dustin, you're happy to chime in. But as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to run this study all around the world right now to really get an understanding of exactly this thing. How, how serious are people taking this? What are people's behaviors right now? Um, and we're trying to get a global picture here um as 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 fast as we can we're we're trying to move fast uh and and we're we're trying to make sure that we get ahead of this um as i'm sure many of of, of you know these type of campaigns or these type of studies usually take a lot longer and so we're we're bound to make many mistakes as we as we continue and one thing that i'm really hoping for is that we can all come together to try to uh, contribute to our understanding of why people might not adhere to guidelines, particularly as these things are likely to, to change over time. And so if you have leads, if you have the ability, if you have resources, if you have an interest to do more of this, please go out and do it. Please try to contribute to our understanding so that we can inform everybody else and so share what you learn so that we can build on each other's work as fast as we can, because right now we all need to come together to have a better understanding. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I would just add <clears throat> to the to the question comment that um, yeah absolutely uh, enriching the data and the experiments with qualitative insights that could then uh, loop back and inform the next set of treatments uh, I think is great but as, as Jan mentioned it's a bit slower of, of an approach these things ideally come come together and, and enhance each other um, but um, the focus of this uh, study at the moment is not on those qualitative insights but absolutely valuable and um and let's hope that some folks can do it so uh get in to touch. that end agnes um asked i'm interested in getting involved and in helping out with the research in relation to social distancing who can i reach out to so probably your emails me. i think probably to me and to dustin okay. at the same time and okay. uh, dustin will coordinate perfect yeah, and um uh, there, I'll be sending out um, in the thank you email with a the recording, their contact information will be that as well. So feel free to reply to Dustin and Jan at that point in time. Um, oh, here's a more abstract from Andrew. Uh, of workers and students who are, now who are now virtually working, what percentage do you think will want to work that way going forward after the crisis while there'll still be offices and schools? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, I, I I really don't know. There's um there's this great uh, article I read how uh, the big changes that are happening right now in our society. So changes in the U.S. like providing people with sick pay or understanding that perhaps evictions uh, within vulnerable populations aren't the smartest thing to do. That a lot of the changes that we're doing right now at a local, at a state, and at a federal level are things that once this whole crisis is over, people are really going to look at and say, wait a minute, why didn't we do this in the first place? So we know from, from prior research that defaults, so what, what, what is the status quo, tend to be incredibly sticky. And when we didn't do something in the past, that becomes a big motivator for not doing something in the future. But now that we are changing things so drastically, 
Likewise, there might be a, a carry-on effect such that it becomes the new status quo. And in the future, we're going to ask really hard questions about removing that, that policy. Wait, should we now remove sick pay? And that's a very different question than should we provide sick pay, for, for example. And so, Andrew, to your questions when it, when it comes to remote working, it's going to be a very similar conversation. So we've now, it, sick, uh, a remote work for many used to be an option that some did. In the future, you're, it's not going to be about remote option perhaps uh, um, being the default, but for many, they're going to realize that you know remote work is something that I can do. I've learned how to do it. And so people are not going to ask themselves, can I work from home today? But they're going to ask themselves, do I have to come into the office today? That's one possibility of what I imagine happens in the same with, with remote teaching. All that is to say, there's also a lot of benefits for people serendipitously interaction, interacting in classrooms and offices. And it's something that time will tell in the future. Great. Yeah. And I would just add that I, I, on the bright side, I hope that that is a byproduct of what um, comes out of this. It, at a minimum, our ability to be more effective in remote learning and remote collaboration and remote working um, when and where we need to or choose to. And then even a bigger picture, uh, thinking about um, just collaboration with, uh, with outbreaks, with flu season, um, things like washing your hands, things like staying home, things like communities and populations, uh, adhering to guidelines um, and getting better at that now that we, we have a, a precedent and, and we have experience under our belt. I'm hoping those kinds of carryover effects will, will just, you know, will benefit societies at, at large um, for whatever kinds of problems or context we are bound to face at another time. That's what that is, that expression, never waste a good crisis. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I have it quite right, but I know there's an expression. Okay, now we have a question from Tafuk, Tafik. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. I am wondering if this survey had any questions that measured any intervention for managing anxiety and minimize arousal from all the anxiety-inducing news and information that's being circulated around. Uh, we did not. Um, we we focused on the more proximal thing, uh, which is getting people to stay at home. Uh, but to think to your point, I think it is so important to think of these second order things of uh, what is the anxiety that is associated with uh, with the news, uh, the anxiety with knowing that other people that you know and love might be affected, might be at risk, uh, and seeing things happening in society that uh, that is just very hard to swallow at times. And so. These type of mental health interventions, I think, are just so important and something that I hope other people take the mantle on doing uh, as we move forward. Um, and that here's a question from Sander. I am surprised that treatment five and six, expert source, did not have an effect, if I recall correctly. Any ideas why in Italian context? And can you just show those um, in treatments yep. up again? Mm -hmm. Happy to show that again. So let me just go into this and show. So, uh, Sandra, to your point, I think it's not necessarily that they weren't effective. Is that we, uh, as I mentioned before, for a lot of the uh, for our dependent measures for a lot of our outcomes, we were at ceiling. And what that means is that for a lot of people, they already believe it's important. Uh, and we need to understand that in Italy, that has been the messaging for for a while now. So I'm not really sure to what extent this is in addition to something that they've already been reading and seeing in the news and hearing from their governments. Um, that is not to say that it might not be effective elsewhere, right? Again, as I mentioned, I don't think that we're getting a lot of this information in other countries right now. Um, and so this might very well be effective elsewhere. Um, but in terms of why this was, wasn't effective in Italy, my, my hunch is it's because it's A, messaging that already exists and B, for a lot of people that yeah, they are already at ceiling there. Mm -hmm. Um, here is a question from Aiden, and I just scrolled away from it. And she asks, would you recommend sharing information about health consequences, modeling good behavior, and appealing to social norms within a close social network or to a broader audience? My intuition is that people on my close network, Instagram, text, would be more likely to see me as a trusted source, but public platforms such as Twitter would reach a broader audience, but might reach people who are not already bought into the need for social distancing. Um, so I spoke with a lot of my friends recently. I was surprised how 
lax they took social distancing. Not all of them, some of them take it seriously, some of them take it very, very seriously. But within my social network, I found people who didn't take it as seriously. I think we can take this challenge on ourselves to reach out to those people, to try to understand where they're coming from, to listen um, and meet them where they are at, to try to understand how we can communicate as best as possible the importance of staying at home, the importance of engaging in other social distancing measures. And, and to your point, I think um, there's also a huge role to play with who we can reach outside of our direct networks, which is why I'm hoping that organizations, uh, governments who have that access, who can be that source for others, are able to do that. Um, but it must come from a place of authenticity. And I think a lot of us in the last couple of days and weeks have received emails from businesses and organizations that we've been a customer of years ago or what seems like forever ago with what they're trying to do in order to combat coronavirus. And a lot of that felt pretty inauthentic. Um, at, at least that was my my feeling. And so we need to make sure that when we do this, it does feel authentic and it does come in from a place of good. Um, but both proximately and I think publicly, there's a lot we can do to make sure that people are, uh, are adhering to the guidelines. Mm -hmm. So I just want to uh, wrap this up right now. So I really appreciate your thoroughness and willing to field a lot of questions. And I just actually sent, a, this came into the questions from David and I just shared it to everybody in the chat section. Viacom is apparently in the Ad Council are debating alone together a social campaign about social distancing trying to reach young adults. So um, I haven't barely looked at it, so I can't recommend it per se, but I would definitely say go click on that link in the chat and also include it in the thank you email. So thank you again. Um, I will be sending out the recording, the slides, some links, Jan and Dustin's uh, in, uh, contact information and a whole bunch of information that should come out in the next hour or two and we'll be posting it onto YouTube and to um, our website so feel free to share it widely um, obviously the more that we can get people involved and communicating is great so I really wanted to thank you Dustin and Jan and do you have any last words for everyone stay safe Dustin. stay comfy and uh work well and live well while we can here. <laughs> I think my last word is um, media diets. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Just make sure that you make sure you make sure you, you you keep your media consumption to particular hours because otherwise you're going to go crazy. Look at cat photos. I can always recommend a cat video. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for joining us and watch your email for the recording coming to you shortly. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.